Well, very, very good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for, for joining today. Um, this is part of the sixth series of the webinars that we're running as part of the Constructing a Digital Environment uh, program. Um, details of the earlier webinars we've run are all on our website and on the YouTube channel, which we have. Um, links to both of those will be popped onto the chat in just a moment. Um, there's a Q and A se section in the uh, fo footer of the page, and uh, if you have questions for the colleagues today, please pop them in, and we'll do our best to to bring those in. So I'm Steve Hallett. I'm one of the constructing a digital environment uh, digital environment champions of of the program, and the focus of this program really looks at supporting the development and the application of digital approaches in environmental science. And in this series, we're focusing on um, the demonstrator projects that we are supporting through the program. So there's a number of these demonstrator projects and each of the webinar looks at each one in turn. And um, this area that we're covering is a very important one because the, we live in a complex, complex world and the human and natural worlds intersect, of course, in, in ways that are unimaginably complex and so, in effect, we need improved and better tools to enable us to tease apart and understand the processes that are going on, to understand the implications to our society, and also both at a local city, regional, and, and indeed national and global scale. And these are all very much key issues that, are, that were discussed even, even in COP27 recently, of course. And so, um, one of the things to, to note is the, the focus in these webinars is very much on the concept of the digital environment. And this is an approach whereby we are trying to represent natural processes and the world around us in digital forms. And both methodologically and, and of course, philosophically, developing a digitally enabled environment for the benefit of, of all scientists, policymakers, businesses, communities, and, and the public trying to understand these complexities that we have. And we touch on an arc of technologies from capturing data with sensors through to the handling and transport of that data, the storage of that data, the an analyses, the analytics that go with that, the, the processing and the visualization and decision support activities. And many of our demonstrators uh, as, as today will hear um, pick, pick off across that arc. And, very much the other focus of these talks is the interdisciplinary nature of the projects that we are supporting and that's one of the reasons why we're delighted to have the whole team from the retina project with us today to to give that full spectrum of insight into what it is to take part and to put together a project like retina and i'm very pleased to to welcome all of you and jagadish as the as the sort of lead for this project um, Jagadish, I, I wonder if I, I could ask you in a moment to introduce uh, all of the colleagues on the team, and then I believe you're going to give us a, a, a bit of an overview with, with PowerPoint, and then we'll we'll get on with the discussion. So if that's okay, Jagadish, over over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thanks for inviting us, and I'm very pleased to talk about Retina Project and introduce our team, this one. And before I uh, ask the people to introduce themselves, our team, uh, I would like to say that this project was led by James Hutton Institute with collaboration with Aberdeen University and CH. Um, we have a huge number of people working in this project who are participating in this webinar as a basically subset of them. So, um, and also we have a really good mix of uh, experts here, including folks from soil science, uh, computer science, biogeochemistry, uh, modeling, social science, and even the app development. Uh, it's a real diverse group. Uh, we are excited to show um, all these different perspectives, how they come together to produce something innovative in this project. Uh, so I would like to um, introduce Pete Smith here. Hello, I'm Pete Smith from the University of Aberdeen. Um, uh, Kit McLeod. Hi, I'm Kit McLeod, based at um, James Hutton Institute outside Aberdeen. Uh, Elizabeth Cowdery. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Cowdery. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the James Hutton Institute. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, Damien. 
Hi, I'm Damien Bianchowski. I'm a, also a researcher at the James Hutton Institute based just outside Dundee. Uh, thanks, Damien. And David? Hi, I'm David Donnelly. I'm another Hutton scientist, uh, also based up in Aberdeen. And finally, uh, Becky? Hi, I'm Becky Smith. I'm a research software engineer for the James Hutton Institute, also based near Dundee. Thanks, Stephen. I would like to share my presentation just to give you an overview of the project. Then we can have a Fantastic. discussion. Please, please, the floor is yours. Then. Let's give us a short, a short overview. Hope everybody is able to see this. Um, these slides, yeah. And um, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting us again. And I'm very pleased to talk about the digital project. Um, which focus on developing a digital monitoring verification reporting system. Just to give you a background, this is the UK greenhouse gas emissions by sector. As you can see from 1990 to 2020, there are substantial reductions were achieved in some of the sectors, especially energy sector, focusing on re renewables. But I would like to highlight here the agriculture sector, which is almost stayed flat, more or less. Um, that means there is a huge possibility to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but there is little progress was made in the agriculture sector. So it is the same thing in Scotland. Scotland agriculture stands at the third position in terms of the source. Um, if we see the change in the net emissions from last several decades, there is substantial reductions were achieved in the energy sector and land use sector, especially increasing the forest areas. But when we come to the agriculture sector, there is a very little progress was made, even though there is a huge potential uh, in this sector. So if we want to achieve net zero by 2050, we need to make substantial reductions in every sector. As we can see in this graph, 1990 to 2018, there is reductions were achieved, but in, in order to hit 2050 net zero, with the, the streak of the curve indicate that we need to make substantial reductions, including the agriculture sector. But to just go into the background of this one, agriculture sector Q is a huge potential in terms of sequestering the carbon into the soil. And there's a wider consensus on the agri uh, scientific community that there is a, about this potential and uh, cropland uh, worldwide could sequester between 0.9 to 1.8 by petagram carbon per year. But soil organic carbon, but the complication here is that soil organic carbon content and the, in the soils and greenhouse gas emissions cannot be easily measured, which is one of the key barriers for implementing programs to achieve net zero. So there is a need for credible, reliable monitoring verification reporting platform to uh, and reduce uncertainties in uh, national reporting and also emission trading especially operationalize the carbon market in agriculture sector, and also track towards net zero, because we need to inform the farmer where they are in terms of their journey towards net zero and make them uh, make a conscious decision on this. So the overall uh, objective of the Retina is to create an iterative near real time digital monitoring verification reporting system that forecasts crop yield, greenhouse gas emission, and carbon sequestration at the farm level. So this will also create an end-to-end -end data pipeline from collection to the processing and understanding the data and to improve the way we visualize the data, advancing modeling and decision making. So, so this will give a conceptual diagram how the entire um, retina works. We, in this project, we first look at the at the farm level we look at the baseline what is the actually the baseline what the farmers are doing in order to do that we need to have and we developed an automatic land parcel detection uh, in in the app that means once you choose a land parcel we integrated all the information associated to the, uh, that uh, land parcel in the background that means the farmers will be able to see what is with the existing databases what is the soil carbon stock what is the soil carbon levels, what is the nitrogen, and all the set of information, and also the climate data with the existing databases. And then we dealt with smart sampling. That means we guide the farmers to take the soil samples based on the local information, which is available, which is pulled all the information from the existing databases. 
So this is more tailored to the local conditions. That's what we call it is a smart sampling. So then we are going to, we deployed the sensors. Uh, we are capturing the information at three different scales. Uh, one is at the plot scale, where we are deploying the soil temperature, moisture, and other uh, sensors into the field. And also at the landscape level, we are running the drone to look at the crop growth and biomass estimation so that we can estimate how much is the soil carbon input into the uh, soil. So again, we are using a remote sensing uh, to track the fallow period and also plowing events and also the planting and harvesting. We are trying to track this one and validate what is really going on in the field. So we are integrating all this information and also we are, uh, in order to, we are feeding into the model basically. So produce the output and pass on to the end user. So in order to uh, run the model, there are three basic information we need. One is biophysical information, soil cling condition and the climate and the management information. So by biophysical information, we are collecting through the real time monitoring with sensors whereas the management information is still missing. That is the reason we have developed an app, which is called Retina app, which is used to collect the information and also provide the output to the farmers, the, uh, to the farmers. So the app will, uh, the, all the information that is going into the app that will be utilized by the farmers for decision making on the field. So, the app will, the farmers will enter the information, the management information to the app that will feed back into the model, into the system. So the models will run even for the future conditions and then predict what is the best management practice for the particular location and advise the farmers. Once they adapt that one, again, the feedback will continue. So this will be useful for two stakeholders. There are major stakeholders, one is the farmers and agri-food businesses. The farmers can utilize for the carbon farming and also better management, they journey towards the net zero. And in future, they can use it for carbon trade because it's a more digital uh, monitoring verification system where we can provide a digital reference to every activity so that it will provide more credibility to the system. And also it will substantially reduce the cost of monitoring and verification. So because we are using the a digital system, whereas currently, in the market, they need to go physically and monitor and verify, which is very expensive. So, and also agri businesses, if they want to go towards the net zero, uh, like Nestle and many other companies which are rely on their uh, supply chain, where the supply chain emissions are very high, if they want to reduce their product uh, emissions, they need to focus on supply chain. So they can use this system to monitor their emission, uh, track their emissions through the system because it produces a real-time uh, update to that. So what are the benefits of Retina technology here? Yeah. So it's an iterative real-time model prediction that gives, and also complete data traceability. This is very important because it will provide a lot of credibility to the carbon market if you want to go back. And also data collection directly from the field without any input from the farmers. There are many tools existing that currently in the market which are very cumbersome, needs a lot of input from the farmers, and the way you process and input to the farm information, actually that will change the outcome. So we are bypassing that actually, we, so that the farmers need not input uh, much information here. Um, Real-time data-driven science bring more credibility and transparency, and real-time data visualization, for informed decisions at the farm level, for example, if the farmers have made any activity in the field, for example, if the, today the farmers love the land, the system immediately show what is the impact in terms of greenhouse gas emission, how the carbon it is going to change in the field. So they can make an informed decision. And we are using tier three models instead of tier two factors. That's also enhancement in terms of metrology and high quality soil and climate data success and integration. And also this will pave a way for the digital twins as we go along. So one of the prerequisites for the digital twins is to real-time system, real creating a real-time system. So this is what actually we are trying to do. So in terms of retina outreach, what we have done so far, um, 
we have focused on four areas. One is uh, we have an engagement with the industry and the scientific community and policy and public. Uh, we have presented several outcomes um, in the Royal Highland Show and Arable Scotland, where we have interacted with several farmers there. So that's one engagement we have, and several are coming up this year too. Uh, the project runs up to this year, August. So we have several events are planned. And also we have uh, an engagement with the industry. We have several discussions with Syngenta, Nestle, Yovali Yogurt, AgriCarbon. And also, in fact, we put a bid to the DEFRA farming futures in order to scale this technology. Um, it, it, it's in the stage two, which we have, it went up to the stage two. So they have a lot of interest from the industry on this project. And also scientific community, uh, we have presented the, some of the uh, outcomes of this project in various uh, international um, forums, uh, soil organic matter dynamics and CO and uh, so, so other conferences. And we have two scientific papers published and several are in the pipeline. And actually the technology we have developed in this retina led to several projects for us, follow-on projects. Some of them were EU Sense project, 1.4 million, and SOAR project, Net SOAR project, another 1 million, and Recess uh, Transition project, which is 1.5 million, which are all based more or less on the things which we have done in retina. And also the, we have a lot of policy engagement uh, during this last two years. And we are interacting with Scott government and also DEFRA. I have given several presentations in the DEFRA. And also we are working very closely with the Scott government. And this is one of the picture we can show that this is the, the I'm explaining to the, about the project to Mary Gushen, who is the cabinet secretary uh, of the Scottish government. Uh, very good. So, uh, finally, the one thing I would like to say is the retina spin out. Uh, this is the, what we have developed in the retina. We want to scale it up uh, through this spin out that's called the Carbon Express, uh, which is in the pipeline. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Jagadish, thanks. Thank you very much for, for that uh, overview, really very comprehensive overview of the, of the project. And it's good to get that sort of feeling for the, some of the impact that you're clearly having with the, the Scottish government as well. I mean, you've, you've mentioned um, a number of challenges, really, and uh, I was thinking in terms of maybe, uh, Pete, I could, I could sort of turn to you here. Um, some of the negative things, the, the emissions from this sector are, are growing and there needs to be ways to address that. And on the other hand, side of the coin, some of the positives in the sense of the opportunities for sequestration and, and uh, you know, the, the mention of things like credits, I'm really interested in, in that. Well, what's, what's your take, Pete, on, on the sort of size of the challenge and what, the, what that challenge is? Yeah, so the challenge is to get into net zero. And we know that there are going to be some emissions that are very, very difficult to abate. And we must offset those with sinks. So we already know that. And so soil, soil carbon sequestration offers the potential for a really big sink, uh, about five gigatons of CO2 per year globally which is about 10% of our current global emissions. Now that's a technical potential, not an economic potential, but it shows the size of the, of the potential mitigation benefits that we can get from carbon sequestration. The biggest barrier, why it's not happening, happening is, the, uh, is it's difficult to monitor, report and verify uh, those changes. With a, with, when you plant a forest, you can go and put your tape measure around trees and you can demonstrate that it's growing every year. And you can, you know, you've got a good estimate then of the increase in biomass. You can't do that with soils. You can't see the organic matter. So MRV is the biggest challenge. So what's stopping it being implemented more widely and stopping the farmers from getting the carbon credits or the benefits from it is the lack of MRV. So that's what Retina, what the Retina project aims to address. And if we can crack that nut, it could unlock the potential that soils have to, to form that real real big sink that we know they have the potential to do so you you see a way of actually carbon carbon credits extending to the soil in this in this in this way through uh, through monitoring and and uh, that's really interesting um yeah okay i mean I, I i sense then that one needs digital approaches to 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 monitor the soil conditions you've talked about sensors going in the ground and of course one of the the thrust of the of the program that's constructing a digital environment is this notion of digital environment i'm just wondering what the what the uh the context is for your sort of interpretation uh, team as a as in terms of 
the digital environment. Maybe, uh, Kit, you, you, you have a, a view on, on the, you know, how, how do you deal with a uh, digital environment in, in your work and how have you addressed this? Yeah, no, no, thanks, Steve. And it's a sort of, a, <clears throat> I see it as a sort of a gradient, like, like many others, you know, we've been carrying out environmental modelling for, you know, 40, 50 plus years. Um, and, and this was highlighted in the sort of the, the report by John Sidborne and others about the in, information management framework for environmental digital twins. It's a gradation from environmental mm. models to maybe uh, real time digital twins. So picking up from when, where Pete left off, to have these MRV systems, then it just needs to be digital to bring together the information and knowledge to provide those robust and transparent ways to um, to enable that all parties have got confidence in the system. And Jagadish might want to say a bit more because his expertise on in carbon MRVs. Yeah, what do you think, Jack? Yeah. yeah, I would be certainly add to this. Um, what actually we have been in the modeling for the last twenty years, at least myself. One of the limitations we see is that lack of data that is coming from the field. The models can learn about the system only if there is a data flow from the system. A continuous data flow really helps the model to actually learn about the system better and really mimic better. So this advent of digital technology, especially the sensor technologies, really help us because that's what actually data, we will streamline the data from the field to the model. And then that will make it really powerful because the model will, is capable of learning about the system and get better and better over a period of time. So I mean, that I gives... the, 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 you know, are there, are there particular areas where you could apply these approaches in, in other contexts or are there areas that you, you think perhaps wouldn't be appropriate for this sort of approach and what, what are those and why? Um, no, actually, I see much more at the system level, uh, even though we are focusing here on the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, but these models can be used for nitrogen uh, optimization in the field and many other things related to the agriculture uh, management actually this can be extended and many models can be bring in into the system in the, the into the framework actually even the biodiversity elements of it which can be included in the latter part of it so that we can comprehensively look at into the environment and record monitor and verify this is very three elements which are lacking even in the government policies, many policies now targeting towards the result oriented uh, approach. So when we want to look at the results, we need to know, we need to monitor and verify those results. Yeah. Uh, so in, these... in terms of those, those objectives, the sort of monitoring and so on, and we clearly the, the, the role of digital is, is key here. I mean, let, let, let's um, turn our focus a little bit to the, the technology that you, you're, you're using. Um, I mean, it'd be interested to know, uh, from you, what 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 sorts of technology are you using? You've mentioned sensors in, in the ground. I, uh, you know, you showed the photograph of a rather interesting looking sensor with the minister. Um, I mean, maybe some of the who who are the uh, who are the sensor people here? Um, I'll jump in. It's Damien and myself kind of do a lot of the things with the sensors. Hmm. Um, so I have come on board to manage the or to help manage the LoRaWAN enabled sensors so mm. we've got we've got two sites one is arable um, and one is upland pasture um, and they both have the same sensors across them so each site has a weather station um, and a CO2 sensor and then both sites have a differing number of soil moisture and temperature profiles they're called um, which stick into the ground and take readings um, one of the things that we've sort of had to had to manage is you know being able to load of works on line of sight technology which sounds great because it can go up to 10 miles and things unless there's a hill or some trees or a building and so it can be a bit more complicated in working out where what sensors can actually be seen by each gateway, um, which is the receiver for this, the sensors. Um, we've also had issues in terms of the um, some of in the um, upland pasture, the ground gets more solid at a higher or closer to the surface. So we've had to use shorter probes, which means that they don't have as many measurements. Um, those ones were also um attacked by some sheep 
Sheep found the sensors um, very interesting. Um, we've now built them little protective cages, which you can see. Um, but to begin with, they were very interested in our sensors and did want to eat them. Um, on the arable farm, we've had a similar issue in that a tractor versus a sensor is bad. Um, the sensors don't like that very much. So our original placement decision um, didn't take into account where the tractors would have to drive. And that's, I think that's been a, a key learning point because we don't want those sensors run over. Um, and something that we would definitely do differently next time is not put them in the tram lines. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are the sort of the LoRa um, sort of radio wave technology sensors that, uh, sensors that we've got in place at the moment. And Damien does some cool things with drones and stuff. So I'll let him talk about that. Well, I, like, I like the idea of having less tasty sensors. I think that, that's, a, that's a key <laughs> challenge that I don't think other teams have mentioned at this point. So <laughs> it's a new one for us. <laughs> Damien, yes. Well, I mean, you, you're using uh, aerial platforms as well to capture, to get, because on, on, on the one hand, you have a, a specific sensor at a point. And I guess, Becky, the, the challenge would be, how do you know that that point is representative of the area that you're you're, you're trying to capture. But and then on the other hand, Damon, you, you're using drones and aerial platforms to look at the whole sort of whole farm or whole whole enterprise. And how, how have you approached that? And what, what sort of challenges have you, you had with that? Yeah, so uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, yeah, so Retina, I've been conducting aerial surveys of those two experimental sites that Becky was just mentioning. And the ambition um, was to produce maps of the distribution of above ground biomass. Um, and you know, to, to do this, I was using uh, off the shelf um, a UAV with multispectral sensors. And um, originally, well, well so I flying multiple surveys at each site um, over the growing seasons. And originally, because I'm quite new to the, the area of uh, aerial imaging, um, I had sort of made an assumption that existing models of biomass that other people had um, produced and published might would be applicable. Uh, but we discovered quite quickly that the models that other people had produced based on their um, data, their sensors collected under different conditions couldn't be applied to, to the data that we were collecting. And so in tandem with the, um, the aerial surveys, uh, we've also been collecting ground truth measurements of biomass. So, you know, cutting quadrats and drying them at the arable site and using a GPS pressure plate meter at the upland pasture one. And so actually we are sort of still in the process of constructing our own biomass models to map the biomass over the fields to feed into those MRV. So that's kind of been one of the, the big sort of challenges. What were some challenges. of the reasons why, why you couldn't use the, the, the models with the sensors you had? What did you find? They, they just gave bizarre results yeah. as to as to how much biomass. It's just that the, 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 I suppose the, the situations that they had been trained on, um, those models weren't directly um, applicable to, to what we were doing, even though, you know, pasture grass and things like that, but it perhaps only been trained on a, a subset of situations of heights of grass and things. And we were looking at a broader um, mm. kind of range of data. And so areas where the grass is obviously very thin, it was still giving quite high values and things. So it just, it, it was clearly incorrect. Um, and so we're having to develop our own ones. And those are sort of still under construction. Um, and to be fed into the the MRV models going forward, um, reevaluate re those those models as well. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, uh, those models work for you know the the. Of course, we're using a slightly different you know set of sensors and you know different geographic uh, situation. So, yeah, um, and we have other sort of challenges that I guess will come into play moving forward. It, my collection of data and the processing of it um, is is very sort of manual, has a lot of manual steps. And I think for the future automation of that of um, life is, life. is probably going to be uh, a bit of a challenge. If, if, you, if there was an expectation that a particular landowner would have sort of surveys done of their land, when to do it, best time. And I mean, um, I'm interested, uh, and Jagdish mentioned that we're sort of paving the way, I think was the phrase used for 
digital twins. It'll be interesting to to come back to that in a bit and see, you know, what what would need to happen. You've mentioned automation being being one thing. Um, you know, so you know, Becky and Damon, you're you're referring to sensors in the ground and and obviously at aerial platforms. But of course, there's other ways of capturing data as well. And um, you know, there's a there's a, a a link that I suppose needs to be captured where people and technology interact as well. Particularly if you're trying to to build citizen science type approaches and uh, you know, I, I know uh, David. Um, you've got your camera. Are you there? Yes, David. You've you've built a number of these sort of tools, and I think that's been factored into the the, the project. And and in our in our discussion uh, before, I think you mentioned there was a, a short clip that you might you might even show of some of the the apps that you've built. But what, what's your what's your take on that sort of interface between people and technology in in projects like this? I think the key thing is, and it's really no complicated understanding that you're making the app for somebody else you're not making the app for yourself you're not making the app for research scientists in this case we're making the app for a farmer so it's, it's got to be suitable for a farmer even to the extent that um well and certainly in this part of the world that you, you, your archetypical farmer is a kind of son of the soil so an app on a phone with tiny little buttons just just isn't going to work it has to be actually physically usable so that that's one aspect the other aspect is um well actually what i should say um we did have plans for effective stakeholder engagement but unfortunately covid got in the way of those uh, and yes. they've been delayed um they had in fact about to be abandoned at last minute so but we have some more planned for the next few weeks uh, and we'll try and get those the outcome of those into the into the app. And we have a number of um, active farmers, actually the institute as colleagues, either the spouses or or farmers. Um, yes, you mentioned the video. Um, do you want to run the video and I can talk talk to the video, Jagadish? No, I think that would be good if you've if you've got it there. We can. I mean, there was a very while while uh, Jagadish is just doing that. David, I mean, there was a very interesting um, talk. The, the last webinar all about the idea of co-creation of um, citizen science with um, apps. I mean, it may, it, it, the, some of the concepts that they that the that, that team were were drawing could be uh, could be of interest as you as you develop the the thoughts in that area. Indeed, indeed. We, we, as I say, unfortunately, COVID really got in the way at the stage of the project, and we were doing that. Yes, um, right, unfortunately. Um, Jagadish, uh, it, 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 it matters not whether you, you run it or not, but if you if you wish, do do share the screen and set it going. Um, yeah, but just talk, yeah. talk okay. through it. Just yeah, so it. Um, now this is a whistle stop, so three minutes. Um, so the app includes registration sections, so you can request to be a user of the app, um, the information stored in a server straight through to site configuration. So this is where we set up, the, if you like, set up the digital farm. Um, this is using an interactive map, as you can see. Click on the GPS button to take you to your location. This is um, simulated, and it's actually taken to a research farm in Glensaw. Change the background so we can see our fields. Click to pick your field. Now, this communicates with the survey database. So grabs the um, field boundaries from um, the, the database in real time records it remotely in our server and also on the on the on the device. Um, now this is showing a map of soil carbon. Click anywhere, and you can see the top soil carbon. And this is very rushed. I'm really sorry, but um, Jagdish men mentioned um, sampling. So this is where we generate sample locations based on the environmental conditions at the site. Um, the app also helps you to measure the samples by using the device um, sensor, so GPS, but I'll just skip on past that. And this section, we can look at a bit more detail. Jagdish mentioned um, extracting information from existing databases. So I can show an example of this here. Zoom into one of the fields we selected. This is a part of our Balrodri research farm. So you can get this, the soil stock just by clicking on the polygon. It's doing the computation. And there we have this total soil carbon for that field, topsoil and subsoil and, and soil nitrogen, all calculated in real time from the Hutton Soil Database. Um, we also record farm activity. So 
can show it. So this is a historic timeline showing spring barley, potatoes, and winter wheat. Um, we also have, as Jagdish mentioned, submit the farm activity to the database so it gets included in the models. This is a little tool I've got for recording the date and crop and activity associated with it. This all feeds into the database on the server, which is then used to improve the model and produce new outputs for the for the, the farm. And I won't press send, but this would send the information to the database, as well as storing the information on a database on the device. We also have access to the real-time sensor data that uh, Becky's been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it's not quite real-time at the moment. I'm not sure whether the sensor is down, but that's the last recorded um, records for the, so we saw moisture, soil temperature, on the site, Becky's looking confused. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Oh, sheep again, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it probably is. <laughs> and finally, um, just to show some sample results, um, carbon sequestration over, over a period of 50 years. And this will quickly show to, yeah, too quick. And that's my three minute um, show of the app. We can, it can go back to it and look. But, uh, one of the main challenges with this is using multiple technologies. I mean, this is using ordnance survey data in real time, grabbing. It's using mapping services from ourselves. It's using um, our data to compute spatial. And it's also using three different types of databases, three or four then, different types of computer languages. And tying all these together is one of the oh, big yeah. challenges because there are no, no standards. So you yeah. have to write the glue that ties one thing to another thing to another thing and make it all useful and meaningful. Uh, David, one of the one of the sort of observations here is that the the beauty of systems like this is is that the farmer should be familiar in a sense if they've been using Google Maps and and other other packages like that they should take to what you've done very nicely the, the idea of bringing up a map changing the background selecting things and so on so it's there's a familiarity I think that's good uh, the, another advantage um, presumably is that you don't need your um, stakeholders to have expensive software and other packages because they all they have to have is the app and then and then they're off, off and away I guess yeah as, as long as we retain it as being free yeah we can continue to use these services because all these services are predicated on not charging right if you start to charge your product then you have to enter into a different agreement see with the ordnance survey into a commercial agreement which the ordnance survey would be happy to do yeah but then you have to start charging the farm and charge I think as long as you can keep these things free at point of use it does make things much more straightforward you're putting a tremendous amount of power in people's hand all that information that they can bring out for that that location um i th thanks very much david that, that's great i mean i'm i'm just um elizabeth if i if i may turn turn to you you, you, you keep your videos going david don't don't, don't disappear um elizabeth um you know you've obviously been working on the on the technology of the rest of the project as well I'm just wondering whether you have any thoughts about you know things that you you've learned as the as the project has progressed in in, in your role and implementing the different technologies in the old, sure. the old chestnut of would you do things differently if you were starting again? Yes, well, um, so uh, I could talk about a couple things actually. Um, mm. One thing I could talk about a, a bit is the automation side of things, yeah. Um, yeah. which actually could. Um, I think tie a little bit into um, design as well. And actually, I don't know, um, it, it might, since, since we sort of have been talking a little bit about automation, you did sort of ask questions about that. It yeah. might be useful to show that slide as well, because it does sort of tie in uh, the things that David and, and Damien okay, and yeah. Becky talked about as well. I think maybe, um, I don't know if Jagadish, if you wanna, if you wanna share it, I can control your screen and flip through the things. This is never going to work. It's never going to work. Maybe I should. Maybe I should share it then. Uh, shall I, Shall I do that? Uh, yeah, go for it. Go. Yeah, I'll do it. Please. I'll do it then. Okay. Um. Okay. One second. Just while Betsy's doing that, um, certainly from from our perspective with the sensors and things, one of the things we have found is that one location of the sensors which David's highlighted with his video and had me very confused because I fixed that issue last night um <laughs> so um is one and I, well I took the video yesterday afternoon so that yeah okay. and I was going but 
the date is up and I checked the live screen and I can see the date is up and then I remembered it was a video you were using when you weren't demoing live. Um, is it, yeah. yeah, I think having more time to play with the sensors and the technology before putting it into the project would have been nice um, and would definitely be something we would do, I would do if I was doing it again next time because this is the first time I've worked with water sensors um, and we've custom built all of the sort of, um, the servers are custom configured, all of the servers and things in the back end so we control everything, um, but it was a steep learning curve and that would have been good to come before the project. I, I think mm -hmm. this, um, Becky and, and Elizabeth, uh, you know, this, this is all about what are the learning points really to, to share with yeah. colleagues and other mm -hmm. folk who might be thinking of doing projects like this in the future. Uh, how, how are you doing with the video? Is that... Oh yeah, no, and actually that, I suppose that's an interesting point is that, uh, you know, when you are uh, using open, uh, open software, open data, open services like that, often you are your own maintainer. Um, which has its benefits um, because you have full control and open access, but often then you are also responsible for uh, your own maintenance uh, and also, you know, uh, understanding the services yourself. And of course, now so many things have such wonderful documentation that it is is very easy. Well, I should say the learning curve is a lot uh, less steep, but at the same time. Um, for example, we did put a lot on Becky's plate, uh, asking to get up and running with the, the LoRaWAN uh, servers um, or, or tech sensors, I should say, um, because that that was, yeah, complete completely new technology. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are other there are other you know, paid services uh, that you can can ask for. Um, but it is it is a different it is a different ballgame if you if you take that if you take that route. I'm just looking. Um, I mean, there's, thank you very much, um, Ed, Edward Darling, who's popped a question, uh, point into the the chat. It looks like the re Red List Revival, if I if I read that right, um, and their work with the Life Map. They're, they they're um, proposing having a, a discussion about potentially mutual interest. That sounds good. So something to follow up, um, follow up following this. And you know, any anyone else you'd like to pose a question to the team, please pop questions in. But if I if I may. Um, perhaps, you know, I think we've we've had a chance to discuss the technology, but one of the things that's interesting really is the, the policy implications of tools like this and the way that technologies support the, um, you know, the, the evolution and the prosecution of the uh, policies, uh, agricultural policies at the national level. Um, Jagadish, if I, if I may uh, turn back, back to you, I'm just wondering what the scope of the policy engagement you've been able to have and demonstrate in the project is and how, how that's gone? Yeah, uh, we have a couple of rounds of discussion with both Scottish government and DEFRA and this one. And still we are in touch and plan several events in the next couple of months. Um, the issue is, that, as I mentioned before, even the DEFRA and also Scottish government looking for the payments in, in future, they want to link for the results. Uh, but we need to provide the technological solution to it. The reason why they can't do it at this point is there is no credible way they can monitor and verify the, these uh, things at the ground level. So this is one of the limitations. I think that's what I see the role of digital technologies can play a big role, especially projects like this, bringing different technologies together and make this work and monitor and verify. And that will allow the policy to roll on. Uh, one of the things we are looking potentially at this moment in Scottish government is Scottish government already pledged 51 million for baseline soil monitoring. So uh, the farmers can enroll and that will be, they can do the soil testing freely that will be paid with the government. And we want to utilize the data into this where we can, they can use the retina uh, the, uh, setup in their farm so that they can be informed about the net zero, how they travel towards the net zero. And the government can use this one for monitor how the progress that is happening in terms of soil carbon stock across once we scale it up. So there is a huge potential, but there are a few limitations too. That's what we are discussing with uh, the uh, with the Scottish government and also with the DEFRA. Thank you. Um... Uh, David, you're showing the current view. I think that. I, yep. mean, it's the that was, I was just to show the live the live live stream from the. Oh, very good. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, we, one of the interesting.
interesting things in, in these projects is the juxtaposition. And we've spoken, uh, David, we've spoken about the, the people and technology coming together. But Pete, if I, if I could uh, turn to you as well, um, it's the, the juxtaposition of the science and the, and the policy objectives. And how, how, have you, how have you sort of pitched that in this project? And how, how, how's, that, how's that gone? And what, what, what are your sort of learnings from, from that that you could share? Well, I think I think the, the, the policy pull is there um, because, as Jagadish has already mentioned, you know, the, the, the Scottish government and the, the UK, the Westminster government is keen to pay for, you know, there's there's the, the ELM scheme in England is going to pay for um, public money for public goods. And um, there's a there's an intention to pay for that on an outcome basis rather than an activity basis. So this this issue of monitoring and verifying and reporting um, changes in soil carbon is important not only for carbon credits for the private private uh, voluntary carbon markets but also for the national nat national inventories and for tracking our our, um, our our progress towards net zero in 2045 in Scotland and 2050 in the UK so there's there's um you know if we can get it right governments I think will will bite our hand off to to, to use this system um, so that's why it's so exciting to be involved in it because it's it's got a, a bunch of policy customers uh, and and government customers just waiting to use it. If we can crack it and, and we're getting close to that, um, it could be a step change forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Pete. I mean, Kit, what 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 are the what are the challenges of of actually doing that of of taking taking the a project like you've got here and actually rolling it out? In, in that sense, what, what what are the sort of challenges that that might might exhibit in in doing in doing what Pete's just laid laid out? As it's Pete highlighted, that there is a demand, and 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 that's key because that's what's always highlighted. The, the, um, but as as Mark Esner sort of often summarizes from the digital twin hub, which is the industry aspect of the of the digital twin activity, it's sort of learning by doing, progress by sharing. And it's actually getting into the details of specific projects like this one and finding what works, but also trying to learn from others, because sometimes um, others, not only within research, but also industry in the tech sector have solved a lot of these issues. And I think one of the challenges, especially for researchers, is being aware of, you know, what are some of those options in terms of technologies um, and choosing what to use and, and what works where. Absolutely. Yeah. I just, you know, I just Go want on. to add to what Kit mentioned here. One of the challenges we see is that we demonstrated this project in two farms at this point, and there are so much diversity in the farm as we go along when we scale it up. We need to live up to that. We need to design the system where the system will cope with that diversity uh, and also the scalability of this. The impact that we can see only if we are able to scale it up. Can we scale it up to 100,000 hectares? Can we scale it up to 1 million hectares? So that is the next phase we want to go in, whether what actually works, we demonstrated here. We want to scale it up to really high uh, land area so that we can see and produce a real-time system that will change the whole paradigm in this. And there are huge challenges in scaling up because for farm level operations, there are many things which we are using that works at the farm level. We don't need such an intense uh, uh, scaling software or um, even when we are, we deliberately use the Docker system here so that we can multiply in, in future that one. So we need to see how this will operate when we scale it up to 100,000 hectares. So that's a challenge, actually. So. Yeah, so, certainly is a challenge. Uh, Pete, as a distinguished scientist in the environmental sciences, what, how, how are these sort of digital approaches um, supporting the advancement of scientific understanding in, in projects like this? So what, what, what's the role of digital in, in helping further our understanding of environmental processes and so on? Well, as a modeler, I would say this, but um, uh, we, we've got to, we, we can use models um, to, to run different scenarios and to examine the science. Our best understanding is encapsulated in these models. It takes many years to set up and run a field experiment. I'm not saying we don't do those. We still have to do those, but they take five years and an awful, a lot, an awful amount, a lot of money to run. So we can use models. We can use the digital environment 
to explore the possibilities, to shortlist the things that we might do and we might might want to look at in more detail, and to base base policy priorities on the outcomes of the models. But that has to be grounded in good data. And we can then go and do longer term experiments, also funded by U UKRI through the through the standard grant mode to, to get to fill in our gaps in the information. But the digital environment allows us to explore much more possibilities quickly and cheaply. Interesting. Yeah. And I mean, are there, are there Elizabeth, if I could just come back to you, are there, are there areas where it doesn't work having a, a digital digital environment approaches? And what what's the learning for where it's appropriate and where it perhaps isn't appropriate? Well, I think uh, um, it's interesting when I got this question, I, I wanted to turn it on its head and say, I, I think that uh, I really benefited from going to the digital environment conference that happened a couple months ago and seeing all the different versions of digital environment projects that are happening mm -hmm. um, and seeing the interpretations of what that meant. And, and seeing that um, even though we can sometimes accomplish a lot, we're still not necessarily always very good at communicating it. Um, and so I think that there's still a, a lot to be accomplished on the science communication side of these things, which is um, a, th that is a point, you know, a, a, a goal point of, of this, this science project. Um, and so although that, you know, there, there is a, an automation side of this, to accomplish the policy and management side of this, and also to uh, actually make the 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 science worthwhile, um, the you know the the digitization won't won't actually, and also to be able to incorporate the the new technology in from from our peers. Um, I saw lots of people trying to do the same things, but in lots of different ways, and we weren't necessarily communicating it very well with each other, and so. Um, I found that to be uh, a, a major challenge that we all need to work on. And hopefully now that COVID is over, we can have more conferences, more communication amongst ourselves, and we really need to hold ourselves to higher standards. I think communication is absolutely critical. Um, and, um, you know, th thanks for mentioning the, the conference. Yes, it was a, it was a fascinating, uh, fascinating time. We, we hope to run another conference um, this coming summer, perhaps in July, but so watch our web, web, website for, for that and we look forward to some more fascinating talks and that. Um, we're beginning to run out of time, but I, I have a, a sort of a last question I'd just like to come back to perhaps Kit and Damon for, for you. I mean, we've, we've we talked about this projects like Retina paving the way for digital twins. And I'd just like to get your, your take and, and others as well, what, what, where things stand with digital twins, what the opportunities are and what, what would need to perhaps uh, develop in, in projects like yours to have a digital twin, what, what, you know, what's, the, what's the gap that we're trying to fill uh, if we're paving the way towards a digital twin? Uh, what, what's your perspective on, on digital twinning? So if I said, I mean, it's, others have said, like Mark Esner, that federation is key, and that's a social technical issue. It's about people, but also enabling it, because especially one business isn't going to take it forwards. I think two other key aspects, one is, is privacy stroke security. You know, that's becoming more and more important where data is and how it's looked after, but also how we do it sustainably. You know, there are different decisions we can make in terms of architecting sort of applications. And some of them have got lower carbon footprints than others. And what we do need to do is um, trying to do this this work as sustainable as possible. Yeah, quite. D Damien, what, what are your thoughts on, on digital twinning <laughs> and how projects like this can That's, Sorry, digital twinning isn't uh, perhaps uh, my uh, background, but certainly one thing that springs to mind is, you know, um, what's a minimum uh, sort of level of data you need to collect to you know accurately reproduce that um you know you don't want to make your data collection for your user too onerous so you need to work out you know what's the when do you start to kind of saturate in terms of for example in the drone flying how often does that need to be done can you get away with it during once in the season does it need to be three or four times to get accurate representation for your digital twin um i suppose that's a key challenge 
um, to make sure that you're collecting enough data to have a, a realistic representation um, and not too much. Maybe, thank you very much, Damon. Um, maybe time for one last quick question before Jagadish, I'll, I'll turn to you just for a sort of a, your closing thoughts. But Becky, if I could, uh, we, we, we've heard about the, the app, that David's uh, shown the, the app, but uh, citizen science is something that we hear about a lot. And a lot of the projects, the demonstrated projects we have are, are looking at citizen science. And um, I just wondered what, you know, what, what your thinking is about the role that citizen science, for science, citizen science in gathering data and what might be some of the issues that, that you might anticipate in, in, in citizen science type uh, applications. I yeah. think in, in this area specifically, um, particularly when it comes to the sensors and things, we, we can't obviously expect everybody to be able to afford a drone. Um, but even our sensors and the gateway and things, are quite, I think it's quite cost prohibitive for just anybody to be able to help us out. And so we need to find a way that um, the general public can assist, um, but without, you know, spending out a lot of money. Um, and I think that's sort of one of the issues in terms of what Damien was saying as well, in terms of, you know, about how much data to collect. It's also how much of this is absolutely necessary. If we can save them, you know, do they need four sensors per field or five or, um, you know, honing that to make it as accessible as possible to get as many people as possible involved in the collection of data. Yeah. I'll, I'll also add to that, um, that um, one of the things that we're trying to show through the app Oh, well, through the through the entire uh, project, is that it's possible to show things like simulations for one's farm, um, uh, like Jamie said, with essentially as little personal data as possible. So, for example, we have regional um, meteorological simulations that we have. We have regional soil maps um, from the James Hutton, uh, and and so. We can start out with baseline data um, and do simulations without input from the user, and then hopefully engage the user, show them where they can, you know, uh, show them the potential that they can add to, and then how the predictions of things like crop yield can improve with their input, and so maybe just with is, just with uh, personalized field management. Uh, you know, them telling us how they manage their crops, then maybe they're willing to invest in sensors for their soil, or maybe they're willing to put up a, a tower to uh, measure uh, meteorological data, something like that. So it can be uh, steps of investment, and they can see how that improves their, their personal predictions. So it doesn't have to be one large investment, and they can see that data, and they can see how it's changing uh, the model predictions, but they can also see something before they've they've actually submitted any data to begin yeah. with. So it's about enriching the data landscape. That, exactly, that, 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 enriching uh, is a fantastic uh, word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, I think that's that's a good a good observation. Thank you for that. Um, so you've talked, um, Jagadish, about the sort of the, the history and you mentioned several decades of modeling uh, leading up. And if we consider um, Retina as being on on some kind of roadmap where that's behind you and it's led to what you're doing now. What's the what's the sort of the roadmap going forward, really, just to finish off our discussion today? Um, where 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 next with with this? Yeah, we identified two streams of development in the Retina, uh, Stephen. One is the technical development of Retina, where we produce a prototype, functional prototype. The next step we want to do is the data really feeds in, now the data is feeding into the model. Now what we want next step is to, the model should learn from the data and modify themselves to really mimic what actually predict well in the field. That's the next step, which we haven't done in this project. That's uh, going to the next technical development. And also the other aspect which we are looking at is the scalability aspect, which we are trying through the carbon extra, the spin out whatever we have developed, how we can scale it up to very large areas and produce this one in real time. So these are the two streams of work development which we are doing and 
several projects are already in the pipeline in that land. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Oh, look forward to look forward to hearing hearing more in, in the coming coming months and years. Well, I think unfortunately that's all we have time for today. We've come to the end of our allotted period of time, and I sincerely would like to thank all of the speakers today. Thank you so much for coming and joining us. I think to to truly understand a, a complex project like Retina, it's wonderful to have everyone here, and it's clearly a project that draws on a number of disciplines, and it's it's that juxtaposition of all of the the different skills coming together, uh, which which makes it so fascinating. Uh, it's been a very useful discussion indeed about the the role of digital environment in in approaching these complex challenges, and we've heard um, a, a lot about a, a lot a lot about that. Um, all the videos that we will um, take, and including today, will be popped onto our YouTube channel, and uh, Cameron has put the link to that. I think on the on the on the chat thank you for that so do come along and look at that and do subscribe to the channel if you if you wish as well and uh what remains then is to um thank you the audience for listening today and to inform you that the next webinar in this series will be on friday the 17th of march um which is speaking about the project sentinel and dr paul brown at ferrer and team the sentinel of treescapes for plant biosecurity and risk so we look forward to seeing you there and thank you very much for joining today. We'll call matters to a close now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks thank for the you. opportunity. Thank you.